The following is a reading from a book by John Colquhoun called A Treatise on Spiritual Comfort, written in 1813, of the way in which believers lose their spiritual comfort. Although a holy man cannot, so much as for a moment, lose that principle of comfort or joy, which the Holy Spirit in regeneration has implanted in his heart, nor yet that entire habit of joy which he is in sanctification implanted there, yet he sometimes loses the sense or feeling of it. He is at times deprived of sensible comfort or of joy of God's salvation. By his losing a spiritual consolation, I do not mean his falling merely for an hour or a day from a pleasant into an unpleasant frame of spirit, for his frames are almost perpetually changing, but his being more or less deprived of the sense of God's peculiar favor to him, or of the sensible possession of spiritual comfort, and that for a considerable time. When the God of all comfort continues for a season to withhold the cheering light of his gracious countenance from his soul, it cannot but be disquieted and disconsolate. Though the Lord on purpose to display his wisdom and sovereignty, to try the graces of believers, to mortify their pride and to teach them the necessity of adventuring as sinners, to trust simply in Christ, for all the grace of the promise withholds for a time sensible comfort from them, yet for the most part he does it in order to chasten them for their sins against him as their God and Father. At the same time, it is not for every sin of infirmity that he suspends consoling influences from their souls, Otherwise, as they can never so much to think a thought without polluting it by some degree of sin, he would at all times be afflicted and with want of comfort. But it is for some peculiarly aggravated transgressions, or for relapsing often into the same sin. It is their iniquities and backslidings that procure trouble of mind for them. Such are God's love to them and care of them, and such is his abhorrence of their sin that he cannot but make even his dear children themselves feel that he is displeased with them when they backslide from him. His faithfulness also to his word in which he threatens trouble as a fatherly chastisement, and even promises it as a blessing in disguise to them, moves him to do so. And though the sins of some particular believers, as in the case of Job, may not in every instance be the procuring cause of their loss of comfort, yet they are at least the occasion of it. All that in this chapter I further propose to do is to point out some of the leading sins and ways of sinning by which believers provoke their Heavenly Father to suspend for a time that degree of holy consolation from them which they have formerly enjoyed. In the first place, they provoke Him to do this by allowing themselves to continue in a culpable degree, ignorant of His covenant of grace and of their warrant to come as sinners, and to trust in the Lord Jesus for their own particular salvation. These are objects in which the comfort of true believers is at all times intimately concerned, the spiritual and distinct knowledge of which is necessary to qualify them for deriving continual supplies of grace and consolation from the fullness of Christ. If believers then allow themselves, surrounded as they are by the clear light of the blessed gospel, to retain ignorance or to cherish mistakes, Respecting the covenant of Jehovah's peace and the infinite fullness and freeness of his grace treasured up in Christ, the glorious trustee of that covenant, they do by this undervalue the only doctrine on which all true comfort depends and so provoke their heavenly father to suspend the consolations of his holy covenant from their souls. The gospel is an exhibition of God's covenant of grace to lost sinners of mankind and therefore it is good tidings of great joy to all people. To be willingly ignorant then, of that gracious contract is the same as to be willingly ignorant of the glorious gospel, and to retain mistaken notions of the former is the same as to err concerning the latter. When true Christians satisfy themselves with superficial and indistinct views of the covenant of grace, or with knowing little more than the first principles of the doctrine of that august contract, they so far despise the doctrine of redeeming grace, the joyful tidings of a free salvation, and so lose the joy of that salvation. Moreover, in the administration of that everlasting covenant, Christ with his righteousness and fullness is freely and fully offered to sinners of mankind in common, and sinners as such are graciously invited, yea, and are peremptorily commanded to believe on his name.
the authentic offer, call, and command founded upon the infinite intrinsic value of the righteousness of Christ and addressed to every sinner who hears the gospel afford to everyone a full warrant to trust in Christ for all the salvation promised in the covenant. If Christians then allow themselves to remain in a great measure ignorant of their warrant as sinners in themselves, to place direct confidence in Christ for all their salvation, or if they cherish mistakes concerning it, they provoke the Lord who is jealous for the honor of his covenant and of his word of grace to withhold from them that peace and joy which are in believing, and at the same time they indirectly invite Satan to tempt them to conclude that they have no warrant whatever to trust that Christ will save them. Were believers to attain a more spiritual and clear understanding of the eternal covenant and of the authentic offer of it, than they commonly do, they would see that they have in the word of grace without them a full and unchangeable warrant to trust at all times in the Lord Jesus for their own particular salvation. And so they would live a more holy and comfortable life than they commonly do. They would in that case clearly see that it is warrantable for them and therefore lawful and reasonable to trust even with full assurance of faith in their faithful Redeemer. Oh, how sinful, how displeasing to the God of all comfort is it to treat with neglect his holy covenant and a warrant which he graciously affords sinners of mankind as such to take hold of it and how effectually will it mar the comfort of one's own soul. Number two. Number two, they provoke the Lord to suspend influences of consolation from them by their yielding often to disbelief and distrust of Jesus Christ. An apostle says, we which have believed do enter into rest. Thou will keep him, saith the prophet Isaiah, in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. And again, if ye will not believe, surely you shall not be established. If a Christian frequently neglects the exercise of trusting in Christ, for fresh supplies of grace and comfort, if instead of trusting with all his heart and at all times as an infinitely faithful Redeemer, for the grace which is in him, and is brought near in the promise, he often trusts to the grace that is in himself. His heart by so doing departs from the Lord Jesus, the only foundation of consolation, and he places that confidence in his own renewed nature, which he is commanded to place in his divine Redeemer. By so doing, he idolizes the new creature. He trusteth in his own heart. He leans to his own understanding. He makes a savior of his own created grace. Thus he provokes his heavenly father, who is the jealous God, to hide his face from him and to eclipse his evidences of grace from his view. It is now necessary that the Lord, who will ever be mindful of his covenant, should perform to him in a higher degree than formerly this promise, From all your idols will I cleanse you. Accordingly, God, in order to chasten him for his idolatry and to teach him the necessity of living continually by faith, withholds consolation from a soul and ceases to shine upon his evidences of grace. The consequence is that the believer now not only discerns no grace in his heart to trust to, but begins to doubt if ever he had any. He formerly looked for comfort to the principle of grace which he discerned in himself, rather than to the fullness of grace which is in Christ, contrary to this high command, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. But now that he can see and feel nothing in his heart but deep and strong corruption, nothing but a body of sin and death, he becomes at once discouraged and disconsolate. Christian, you never have greater need to trust simply and firmly in your divine Savior, than when your graces are most lively and most discernible. For then self-confidence is most ready so to prevail against you as to revoke a jealous God to withhold spiritual comfort from your soul. If you desire to retain holy consolation, repose the unsuspecting confidence of your heart solely and constantly in your faithful Redeemer. Apply and trust and plead His promises. If you distrust Him, if you yield to suspicious and hard thoughts of Him, you transgress against him without a cause. The Lord Jesus has never dealt so in his ways of grace and providence with any soul as to give it cause to be suspicious of him. And what dishonor do you reflect upon the glorious Emmanuel by refusing to trust solely in him? Be not grieved that you have nothing to trust to for your salvation beside Christ and the promise, but rather rejoice that you need nothing besides.' 
Pray often and earnestly that the Holy Spirit may convince you more deeply of the exceeding sinfulness of sin, and especially of the greatest of all sins, unbelief. Number three, they lose their holy comfort. By making their graces or duty or lively frames or warrant or ground of right to trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, these indeed are great encouragements to continue trusting in the Savior. But they form no part of a man's warrant to renew his actions of trust in him. They are fruits and evidences of saving faith, but are no part of the ground of it. To make them the ground or even a part of the ground of our right to confide in Jesus for salvation would be as preposterous as it would be when transplanting a young tree to set the top branches of it in the ground instead of the roots. The faith of a believer must be grounded on faithfulness in the word and not on feelings in the heart. If the Christian then, instead of making the authentic offer, call and commandment to believe, all addressed in the gospel, to him as the center of mankind, his warrant to renew his exercise of trusting in Christ for all his salvation, think so highly of his experiences or evidences as to make them his ground of right to do so, he is guilty of presumption. He sets aside the warrant which the Holy Spirit and the Word affords him and presumes to trust in Christ upon the ground of that in himself which is indeed the fruit but not the root, the evidence but not the ground of faith. Thus instead of a true, he places an unwarrantable confidence in his Redeemer, and by this he discovers a pride and self-righteous propensity that remain in him. Sensible that his holy qualities and performances can give him no right to salvation itself. His legal spirit prompts him to conclude that they will afford him at least a right to the Savior, a right to exercise particular trust in him for salvation. So when he discerns his evidences of personal interest in Christ, he can freely trust him, but when these are eclipsed and cannot be seen, he counts it unwarrantable and presumptuous to confide in him. Now seeing it is pride or a legal spirit that disposes a Christian to think that his graces and evidences can give him a right to apply in confidence in Christ, and seeing the immutable design of God is to exalt the Savior and to humble the sinner, he withholds a comfortable sense of his favor from the believer. He ceases to shine upon his graces and evidences. He not only leaves him, it may be, to fall repeatedly into some known sin, but he permits Satan in a man's own proud and unbelieving heart to persuade him that he has now no right at all to trust that the Holy Jesus will save such a sinner as he is. Thus he has procured for himself the loss of his comfort. But even this loss, how great and grievous soever it may be, is almost less than nothing in comparison of the infinite dishonor which is reflected upon the Lord Jesus by presuming to substitute his own graces and attainments in the room of the authoritative offers and calls of the gospel as his warrant to trust in him, and by not venturing to rely upon him for grace except he see grace already in himself to give him a right to place confidence in him. Believer, if you would retain spiritual consolation, take heed that you never build your faith upon the reports of sense. Build it only upon the sure, the unchangeable record of God who cannot lie. Do not substitute sense in the place of a true and holy word. Build your faith and your comfort upon Christ in the word and not upon your experiences. Do not live upon Christ as felt in the heart, but upon Christ as offered in the gospel. Number four, they procure for themselves a loss of spiritual comfort by discontent and impatience, arising from the inordinate love of some earthly comfort. When a good man is set a place in all his happiness and all his hope in Christ and in God as his God and portion, places much of them in some external comfort so as to be disposed often to say, what would become of me, or how uncomfortable should I be were it not for this comfort, he thereby provokes the Lord, who is always more ready to profit than to please his children, to tear the idol from his embrace. If he begins to make gold his hope and to say, to find gold, you are my confidence, or if he trusts in man and makes flesh his arm, so that his heart departs from the Lord, he shall under the chastening of his heavenly Father be for a season like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. The broken reed on which he leans will not only fail him, but will go into his hand and pierce it. His comforts will be diminished. His hopes will be disappointed. 
His schemes will one after another be frustrated. His idol, whatever it be, will either be torn from him or be turned into a source of daily vexation to him. The Lord will break his cisterns and send a worm to his gourds. For the iniquity of his covetousness, saith Jehovah, was I wroth, and I smote him. I hid me and was wroth, and he went on forwardly in the way of his heart. The inordinate and immoderate love of any temporal benefit does, upon the loss of that benefit, commonly produce discontent, impatience, and fretfulness which have a natural tendency to wear down the spirit. Were the Christian to bear his loss of outward comforts in the exercise of faith and of resignation to the holy will of God, he should still continue to experience inward consolation. But when he presumes to fret and murmur as if the Lord had wronged him or had been unkind to him, saying, Alas, my afflictions are very uncommon, are peculiarly severe, he by this procures for himself in addition to his outward losses the loss of inward consolation. Such a behavior as this forms a combination of various sins, all of which are inconceivably heinous and exceeding sinful. Discontent inclines a man to be impatient under afflictions. Discontent and impatience set his mind as on the rack, and torment it with distracting cares. How to be delivered or how to have his loss retrieved. The secret root of these is an inordinate love of the body and of worldly enjoyments. This again arises from a want of due resignation to the holy will of God, and a satisfaction with him alone is an all-sufficient portion for the whole man, and it is usually attended with much disbelief and distrust of his promise. The Lord in his gracious promise saith to every believer, There shall no evil befall thee. No, says a fretful Christian, this which has befallen to me is evil, otherwise I should not have been disquieted by it. But should it not, on the contrary, even delight the Christian to find that the Lord is drawing off provision from his worldly lusts, knowing that he must shortly die? Ah, why is he so fond of temporal and transitory enjoyments? Why so anxious to acquire them, so eager to embrace them, so disquieted by the loss of them? Believer, your covenant God is all sufficient for you, and he allows you to call him yours. Why then do you go a-begging to creatures for supply? Consider that it is a much greater felicity to desire nothing earthly but what you have than to have all that you desire. Do not any more provoke the Lord by obstinate or sullen grief or any outward loss, lest the worst thing come upon you. Then only are you in a right frame when God in Christ is enough for you. Know that it is in the absence or contempt of earthly comforts that the Holy Spirit is most a comforter. Remember that God is never to be blamed for depriving you of things which would carry away your heart from himself as your sure and all-sufficient portion. Let not your life even for a moment be bound up in any worldly enjoyment. O oh, take heed and beware of covetousness. It is idolatry, and their sorrow shall be multiplied that hasten after another God.